Paul's going to talk this morning about the status of the TOGAF business architecture work, looking at business modeling, business capabilities, value streams, and information mapping. So, uh, Paul, welcome, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm on, yeah. Uh, so, good morning. Um, yes, it is my uh, pleasure, and, and I'll explain why, to, uh, to talk about business architecture. Um, I, I'm sure when I was asked, can you do the talk about business architecture, I said, yeah, as long as it's not first thing in the morning after I've been drinking Guinness, but um, I'll let that one slide. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, give a, a talk about the work predominantly that's been going on through the business architecture uh, updates into TOGAF, um, something that I'm uh, quite excited about and actually have had quite a bit of uh, interest in, uh, mostly, and why this is a bit cheeky, because I've been a consumer and a user of this, so I've really kind of, a uh, very small person, I feel like, stood on the shoulder of giants, and I'm going to give a credit to a few people, not everybody, but a few that have been involved in the core working group and led some of the work streams to kind of do that work. Um, and, and I won't read them out and name check them, and there are plenty, plenty more, and it's not meant to be exhaustive, but, uh, but certainly um, I wouldn't want to stand and take the credit away from these people. Um, so uh, the business architecture. Um, what I'm going to go through is a little introduction just to kind of set the scene of, of what has happened uh, and, and where it sort of fits, um, and then talk through a few things. Overall, what are the improvements, the areas that we're focused in on, and, uh, and what's been produced, uh, and, and I'll give a couple of kind of illustrations as to how that's useful, hopefully, um, and then focus on three main areas, business modeling, uh, business capabilities, value streams, and in four, sorry, information model mapping, um, and then wrap up just to kind of segue back to the credential piece, which is a really nice, neat way of, of, of demonstrating the value uh, that we we're just talking about there. So I'm going to kind of go through each of those just to kind of highlight. Um, obviously, the, I thought the best way to do that was to walk page by page through the standards. <laughs> I'm joking. Right? Just see if anyone's paying attention. Um, so, uh, yeah, a bit of background. First of all, um, you know, the, the TOGAF uh, standard nine, version 9.1 published back in, in 2011. Um, so business architecture, whilst it's been around for a long time, uh, if you go back then, a lot of business architecture was fairly loosely defined. It was kind of referenced, it was in there, uh, but in terms of actually what you did and how you did it, there was a lot of different ways. Um, and you could argue that either that wasn't clear or it competed or, or, or you, you know exactly what should you do about it. Um, one of the things that I uh, uh, used to sort of say, and that in, in all honesty, my own uh, perspective on it has moved on, is I used to reference that it's, um, um, uh, so, so just to kind of set the scene, um, as I said, I used to be the, the chief architect at Raw Mail, um, sort of wearing that badge inside that organization. This is before I joined IBM, so I was actually kind of there, wore the T-shirt, set it up, and then paid the price for all the decisions I made because uh, I was still there uh, for several years. You know, So I've got all the scars. I've kind of carried it. I haven't just kind of come in and, and gone away again and, and uh, a bit like grandparents feeding their children sugar and going away and not worrying about the consequences. I actually had to stay there and, and worry about the consequences and, 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 uh, and do some work with it. And at the time, um, I had responsibility for business architecture, and um, I used to describe it as holding a mirror up to the business. Uh, so that, in other words, the architects needed to know what was going on in the business in their own language so that they could interpret and work out what was going on. Now, that was unapologetically a mostly IT-focused perspective, but that's where I sat. Right? That was my need. So I'm not trying to say that's what's appropriate for everybody, but that's what I was doing. Um, so for me, business architecture at the time was about reflecting what the business needed and finding some way of codifying that, some way of being able to capture that and, and understand it. And the simple argument that I had in discussion with the business was, well, if this is wrong, if I haven't understood it, you're going to get the wrong IT. So, you know, it, it's useful to kind of do that. Now, that's quite straightforward, and I still think that's valuable in itself. Um, but of course, when you look at what's going on, uh, you know, uh, uh, since, since I was doing that, and that was sort of 15 years plus ago, um, actually uh, adding uh, value to an organization requires you to understand the value propositions. 
and um, we heard a lot yesterday about topics and we hear them all the time about things like agile now if anyone actually digs the underneath what agile is about and lean uh, as an example um, it's it is ruthlessly actually about adding value the, one of the key principles in agile if it doesn't do add value don't do it right I don't know if anyone remembers that one but that's the kind of the key basis of it right um, and therefore if you want to be able to be agile, you want to you know, embrace any of that kind of thinking as an example, um, you need to understand what the value propositions are. And that means you really do need to kind of reflect and be able to you know, understand the business architecture more than just hold a mirror up. The other thing that was mentioned a lot yesterday, and apologies for the ones that weren't, but I'm kind of giving you the, the highlights, if you like now, is a lot about innovation as well. Now, to innovate, you clearly need to be able to understand how to innovate, what innovation adds value, where that can come in, um, and what the greatest sort of uh, uh, you know responses are, best to best pieces to put it in on. And that innovation again um, helps if you understand uh, where value is added. You understand what are the things that your business ha does and what it needs to do well uh, to support it. So, so those kind of forces have helped. Um, in, oh, sorry, those forces have increased the need to be able to. Uh, understand business architecture um, and being able to better map it beyond that just that holding the mirror up so to me that's kind of uh, raised the demand and the need and the profile of, of it so I'm very glad to say a load of work has been done by the by the architecture uh, uh, working group and published um, some major improvements in in 9.2 uh, uh, last year uh, and I'm just going to kind of highlight some of those so that uh, you can see where they are and hopefully I've set the context as to why that's relevant but also um, you know to give reference for people so we can kind of advertise and you know they're there right so that's always one of the things I think that's hard is actually knowing what's available and, and what's out there so the key advancements so um, yeah I, I question whether I should start with a model because that always kind of sets people some people get excited but it, this is really key um, because essentially there are three things in there that you'll see repeat. Okay, so those that were familiar with the with the meta model before, there are three key additions: business capability, value stream, and course of action. They're they're circled there, um, and um, I put the model up because these are going to get referenced and, and, and mentioned in the uh, advancements work as we go forward. Okay, uh, and just to kind of set within the the, the TOGAF uh, ADM. Most of this stuff, not exclusively, of course, because anyone who knows it understands how it all feeds through, but just to kind of give the major focus areas. Clearly, there's a load of stuff happens in phase A around architecture vision that's relevant to this. So the whole idea of, of trying to um, join up the difference between strategy and the actual architecture by having something in the middle that creates a course of action, um, sort of uh, that, that bit that sort of uh, stops it being from the strategy just being a kind of a fire and hope that it happens kind of approach, but actually kind of getting that connection. Um, and it's where the uh, initial idea around value streams and capabilities is introduced uh, and then works through uh, uh, starting to kind of expand on, on that basis. But clearly, a lot of the stuff fits in phase B, the, 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 the uh, business architecture phase. Um, and in this area, uh, it ties it into another or other set of activities, things like planning cycles uh, within organisations, um, but actually adds and, and expands the things I said around things like value streams and business capabilities, where they fit, how that sort of sits within the architecture piece. Okay, so um, what I think makes this really, really uh, useful, though, is as well as those changes having gone in, there's a number of series guides. Um, now these series guides stand alone, they supplement the standard and you can look at them and read them and understand what that is about uh, and it helps explain it um, in, a, in, a, in a much sort of a, in a modular digestible manner. And the four that exist, as sort of said before, uh, business capabilities, value streams, business models and information mapping. Um, and, and if nothing else, this is just an advert that these are things that you should or can use. So business modelling. Um, 
So the first one is about business modeling. Now, uh, this to me uh, uh, was, was high, is highly valuable um, and talks about how you might actually have a common framework, talks about co you know, common business models, partly because I don't know about anyone else, but I, I've always been frustrated by um, uh, when I've gone and you know, talk, nowadays I talk with client organizations, but if before when I was working with an organization and I would have people say to me, um, I just want one simple A4 picture of my business. Um, as if that was an easy thing to achieve, okay? You know, it was going to be yeah, one one picture that everyone was going to instantly recognize and kind of go, yep, that's my business. I'm not ever going to argue with it, and that's fine. Um, and, and you can create some sort of magic. Um, so, but the idea of trying to, you know, because the problem behind that was, for me, was actually that one model. The reason why that was always hard is because there's so many different stakeholders have so many different needs from that one model, right, right from uh, a strategic point of view in a boardroom where the executive, you know, executive directors might be looking and kind of going, what do we want to do, uh, you know, what can we do in terms of innovation, through to people trying to reorganize uh, the, the, the way that they're actually setting about going about new major programs, um, or even as much as kind of, you know, what are our major processes and what are we trying to do for certain uh, uh, achievements. And that, therefore, there were always going to be uh, clashes from those stakeholder groups as to what they what they sort of saw as the models. So there's some useful part about how to kind of work with that and uh, and what can be done. Um, and uh, you know the link to, to strategy. You'll see on the the, the right there's a, there's a whole talk about uh, a whole sort of part around uh, the blueprints, the different types of. Um, uh, things that you can use and, and how they sort of fit together um, and how that relates to delivery of strategy okay uh, and reference to quite a few different industry models uh, uh, you know including things like uh, you know some some external ones that we've had presented to the open group in the past I can remember uh, and I'm gonna get the name wrong but it was Alex Ostermeyer I think did I get that right Ostervolder Oster I was close yeah presented on the business model uh, canvas so uh, um, so uh, a, a key part one of the key ones business capability now this is this is a, 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 a fascinating one and um, very glad that this series guide was produced because a lot of ambiguity around the term and so there is a definition that's been created by uh, by this uh, uh, work it defines what that concept is um, uh, I've not put it up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amused that it's uh, produced by somebody who's got a very similar surname to me, but not quite the same, which is unusual. Um, Ulrich Holman, or Homan, it's just got an extra N in it. Um, and um, no, absolutely no relationship as far as I know, but, um, but yeah, that's a nice little segue. Um, but actually talks about um, how you go about uh, identifying and uh, uh, preparing uh, and presenting capabilities. Um, now, this is something which uh, some people, I mean, I was always a big fan of these. Uh, back in um, uh, my Royal Mail days, I can remember reading some papers from Forrester and Gartner, uh, but in particular Forrester, who produced capability models uh, and talked about them uh, being something that was that were necessary. But there was a lot of quiet around it for a long time in terms of actually seeing them and exactly how they would be defined. So I think they've been, you know, the concept's been known, but it's been quite hard for people to kind of uh, get hold of those. Um, I was, uh, we certainly produced one in, in, inside Royal Mail uh, and the post office, the UK post office. Um, uh, and to be honest, we created it from scratch, which was quite entertaining. Um, but, um, you know, perhaps a waste of time <laughs> in the end because it, the, there should have been quicker ways of doing it. And, and when I joined IBM, I was quite glad to find out that there were a bunch of industry ones, some of which we got and some which came from different industry groups. Um, and uh, uh, for example, I know of, a, of an insurance industry one which is run by an insurance uh, consortium of, of organizations. Um, and those capabilities basically give a start for people to be able to define what the abilities of those organizations are, those things that that organization can do. 
hugely valuable construct uh, uh, and very glad to see that it's now kind of being baked in and, and uh, exists here. Um, now, uh, I always define the capability as the ability to do something, uh, is, a, is a simple kind of cheating way of, of thinking about it. Um, and uh, it's very useful from an architectural point of view to think about capabilities because um, if, uh, if you think about some of the other business models, they're often tied up with organizational constructs. And one of the things about capabilities is that they're organizational kind of, you know, agnostic. So you're, they're, not, they're not sort of fitting down purely what the salesperson, the sales director says or the operations director or whatever else. So there's some useful sort of pieces, it, pieces in there. Um, and uh, the other part about capabilities is um, the capability persists, provided that's something you want to still keep doing. How you provision the capability will change. And that then becomes the planning choice. You can decide how do we as an organization want to deliver this capability. Um, do we use different people? Do we use different processes? Do we use different information? Uh, you know, do we locate it in a different place? The classic kind of piece. But the capability is still the capability that you have to have. Um, the other part, just to kind of give a few living examples uh, on this, um, and, and why I, I always lean back on this one as a major one, and I'm, I'm very keen on capabilities, is um, uh, when organizations change and decide they're going to do something different or new, uh, and I'll give an example. I, I did some work many years ago with a, um, a uh, energy company, a, a, a utility, energy utility company, who uh, decided they were going to start doing some uh, trading. They were basically going to start betting on the weather, is the way it looked like to me, to be honest. But that's what, and, and it's fairly commonplace now. I don't know if you, so. Um, but at the time, it was new. So they were going to have to set up a bunch of, of new things to do as an organization. But actually, by them working out what those new business capabilities were that they needed, they could splice that into their business model. And they could say, OK, we are about to do some trading. Um, that means we have to have these capabilities. Um, and they could then work out, how are we going to stand up those capabilities? How are we going to make sure we've got, have we already got some of those capabilities? Do we need to bring some new ones on board? Do we need to stand up, et cetera? So it allowed them to think about that in a non-organizational way. Right? It wasn't one sort of, a, it wasn't a fiefdom debate. It was a debate about were they prepared? What did they have to do? And clearly, from, a, from an IT point of view, that meant that behind that, you could say, did they have the information they needed? Did they have it in the right places? Did they have the technology to be able to perform it uh, to, to support those capabilities? And this is a, just in case anyone's been wondering what on earth the capability looks like, this is a very simplified model, but it's taken from the, from the guide to kind of illustrate that there will be multiple levels and different types. So you might have strategic and core. Uh, and, and, and these are uh, deliberately sort of shown as components. Yeah? So uh, hopefully people are familiar with these kinds of things. Um, and if you're not, then it's a very good guide to introduce you to the, to the concept. Um, value streams. Now this is interesting um, because I, I think I mentioned, well, I mentioned already about Agile and Lean um, and the fact that Agile you know, when, when you kind of really, really boil it down, is actually about adding value, which fundamentally asks the question of, you need to know where the value is added then, right? Because if you don't know where the value is added and you don't know what, then, then you know, you can't actually subscribe to that. Um, so the value streams guide defined what a value stream is. Uh, it talks about the significance to and from the business and enterprise architecture sort of world, uh, and then provides some guidance to, to actually uh, develop in those along with key scenarios. Um, and for example, one of the sort of things it does is it, it, it the, the value stream construct is to kind of say, uh, you know, there's a name, a description, who may trigger it off, and what the value is that it's adding, okay? So what, what, why is that a valuable, uh, uh, why does that add value, right? That's a, a, a key element. Um, and then those can actually be mapped to capabilities. And that's one of the key things about a value stream 
I know there was a lot of discussion and debate about the difference between value stream and value chain, um, and we've clearly, you know, settled in, in through the work that was done through the business architecture uh, worked on value stream. Uh, value streams uh, can be decomposed into the elements that, that map to capabilities. So the idea is that each individual component demonstrates some kind of value add piece, um, as opposed to the value chain, which is a connection where the end outcome is the piece that adds the value. Okay, um, there, there's a lot of commonality, uh, and it's a it's a nuance, but it's a it's a it's a, it's a valuable one when you're talking about individual capabilities. Okay. Um, now, information mapping. Now, um, it's interesting because uh, when I first started looking at information models um, within enterprise architecture, uh, it's often layered just as a, a another information, another layer. But in fact, actually, information, as we know, really kind of runs top to bottom. So it's useful in the business architecture piece to understand what the key information entities are for any business. Now. If that is, you know, for some people that will just be a, a statement of they'll recognise completely. Others may be kind of furrowed the brow and kind of go, why is he saying that, right? So, you know, apologies. Some people will get this straight away and will kind of go, yep, right, you know, fine, carry on. Uh, but but um, uh, as an illustration, um, we all know if we work with certain industries, there are certain terms that when you throw those in, become the key term to any debate. Okay. So I do a lot of work in uh, engineering, um, and uh, you know did a lot of work with a business architecture for uh, a British nuclear submarine builders um, quite a few years ago. He presented in a in a plenary session uh, in in Edinburgh a few years ago, um, and there the word part is absolutely fundamental. Um, that the, that as a key business information entity actually is uh, one of the prime things to worry about from a business architecture point of view. It's not a data thing, right? Um, because part means so many different things to different people. Now, what, now, that may sound either completely obvious to people who have been immersed in that world, sorry, a slight pun there, um, but, uh, or it may seem completely puzzling as to why that may seem so, so, so odd. And I'll give you a little bit of an insight to that uh, and why it's relevant. Um, in a in a submarine world, and, and this is true in a lot of engineering situations, um, when you do the initial design, you identify a part, and a part at that point has a purpose, and you're just defining it, saying, "I need to have a pump, and a pump needs to be able to do this, right?" And you're defined in that way. Much later on, that part has to be procured. At that point, it is a specification that has weight fittings kind of all loads of other information about what it needs to be able to do to be able to perform its function. Um, and that may sound fine, but actually later on when it's being actually assembled or fitted, it, it has a bunch of instructions about actually what it's going to be doing to kind of put together um, that's far more precise because its location is important as well, right? So that all to do with the kind of you know the balance and the, and the weightings and stuff within within say a vessel like a submarine, um, and then when you get into any kind of on go on through life part, um, sorry through life element of the journey, um, part has a com another completely different meaning. So basically, if I walked in and talked to the head of engineering, or I talked to the head of operations, or I talked to the head of procurement, and I said the word part, they might all have roughly the same idea in their head. But in terms of what they needed and what they meant and what it meant for them and the level of definition and the way that they actually uh, looked after that thing was completely different. And therefore, the enabling uh, resources behind that in terms of uh, data models, in terms of uh, systems, in terms of processes were completely different. Um, and just to kind of illustrate why that's uh, key, it takes a very, very long time to design a submarine. And I'm just using this as a great example. Because it is such an unusual thing to have to do, it kind of exaggerates and makes a nice point. But these points exist in other places. And when you first design uh, a submarine, let's take that pump, that part. Um, I might say it needs to have a specification of 
40 something, 40 units. Um, if that's BA, I'm not going to say anything dodgy, don't worry, Max. Uh, so um, it has to have a specification of 40 units. And I'm not even going to try and sort of pretend, you know, anything. I'm just going to say that's a, just if you bear with me, just let it be a random abstract reference, okay? But they have to have a, a specification of 40 units. That then basically says, okay, um, let's go to market and find something that's within these tolerances weight wise, size wise, except, you know, performance wise that can cope with 40. Now, funnily enough, the market only has pumps that do 30 and 50. Okay, so the procurement department go, it's going to have to be a 50 then. That then raises a whole bunch of engineering change requests that go back into the business and says, right, we've now got a pump that does 50. That's fine. It takes five to seven years to design a submarine, 10 plus to build one. Um, so once it's out in service, you know, 15, 20 years after the original engineer has specified the part of that pump, that pump needs replacing. The original company that made those pumps is unlikely to exist in its present form or previous form. So somebody's going to turn around and kind of go, we need another pump, right? Oh, that's funny because that organization was bought by this organization and, and they do pumps and it's similar weight and size and we can kind of cope. But they only do a 40 and a 60. Well, that's okay. We're going to have to obviously it's replace the 50. Well, we can't replace it with the 40 because that would be suboptimal, right? But the original design would have said, actually, that was that was appropriate. So these that's why certain things within your business uh, uh, architecture, like key information, are absolutely absolutely relevant. And just to throw another one in, I do a lot of work with construction companies and construction work at the minute, um, and the word plan is equally. As, uh, as fraught. And I'm sure in all your industries you could find a term which, you know, somebody would say, what about this word? And you'd all kind of go, oh yeah, that's our magic word. That's the one which creates, you know, angst amongst us all. So that was just sort of setting up that, um, you know, obviously we need to worry about what those key information. So this is this is a different level from data, okay? This is, this is trying to work out what are those key information pieces. There's some work around this in terms of information mapping, another series guide. Um, uh, sits with the others and, and helps with that kind of vocabulary and that kind of uh, 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 idea of how you use it, where the processes sit. And, uh, and, and some examples here uh, that were taken from a world which I know nothing about in finance. Okay, So uh, I'm not going to take any questions on this whatsoever. If it isn't material, if it doesn't, if it doesn't dig, fly, right, sink underwater or float, I'm kind of not that interested. I've got to be honest. Ever since I was a small child, it's it's where I where I've uh, focused. Um, so uh, that leads me to uh, so I've mentioned the four different sort of guides there that have been produced. There's some great work. It went into the the specification. One of the problems with work going into the specification is obviously. You need to know it's in there and where it is, right? So this is this is his purpose of this is to kind of call out that it's in there. This was a big big change in the last release, um, but as well as that, these four series guides really help kind of uh, focus and talk about those things as separate parts and are completely aligned. Uh, so it's useful to know. And, and then just a small kind of piece to sort of uh, segue back. Um, there is obviously uh, the TOGAF business architecture level one credential that Andrew uh, and Steve talked about at the beginning um, that builds on this uh, body of knowledge, uh, uses the stuff that's in the TOGAF um, uh, standard specification to actually uh, help provide that, to kind of show and demonstrate uh, what is, I, uh, for, for me, a, a very important uh, credential. Um, we're certainly seeing from, from an IBM point of view a lot more people wishing to certify uh, and be interested in business architecture. There's been always been a few people, um, but it's actually become quite a key career path for a lot of people who ha are working and starting as business analysts and, and wanting to get into business architecture uh, and see that much more relevant to uh, innovation, uh, supporting, as I, as I mentioned before, a lot of these uh, the epics and the story development around things in Agile. Um, it's quite a, a key and valuable role. So that is everything. Thank you very much. Okay.
So the first question that uh, that came in is uh, on uh, about modelling. Um, where do you model? Where or how do you model this? In a UML tool, an Archimate tool, or God forbid, PowerPoint? <laughs> um, so I, I interestingly, I, I have always been. Um, uh, I've never been averse, right, it, to. To using a pen, okay. Oddly enough, um, so um, I, I think uh, there's a number of answers, and clearly it's a loaded question, right? Uh, you know, from from that point of view, uh, from, from towards the end, a, a couple of things that I'm going to say, and the, these, uh, you know, my views, and be interested if, if from a business architecture point of view, whether anybody else thinks any differently. But um, uh, I always wanted to, to uh, so. so this is this is my position. So, as when I was a chief architect at Royal Mail, um, we set about using tooling uh, with a couple of uh, misadventures. So I still have the scars, right? We created a, a, what I call what the whole team called an EA Vault because you could create models. Um, I won't tell you which vendor it was, um, but you could create models and you could uh, put them in there. They were very safe, but you could no one could get them back out. Um, and um, the problem was we kind of, you know, we did that and then we had another go and went, okay, what are we trying to do here? And, and we realized we'd made the classic, classic mistake that we'd been telling all of our customers uh, in the business not to do, which was buy the tool first and then work out what our requirements were, right? Um, <laughs> so, so I don't really want to say here is the answer, now go away and work out what you want to do. What I really want to do is kind of go, what are you trying to do first, right? So if you are trying to uh, model the architecture from a business point of view in order for your own understanding and <coughs> keeping that going, then, then I think there are uh, uh, options. You know, I, I, I've used Archimate. I'm, I think that's a great way of doing it. UML I've seen used. Uh, I mean, I, I have seen PowerPoint used, uh, you know, of course. Um, but. Um, if, however, you are communicating to an exec board what their one single picture looks like for the organization, then I wouldn't be scared of using whatever works best for that audience. So it is that you, you model for two reasons. You model for your own understanding and you model for communication. And modeling for communication has to take the form of whatever message you're trying to get over to those stakeholders. So, so I've cheated slightly with the question. I appreciate that. Mm. But I think that's my personal view and, and what I would always advocate um, is the best way to well, approach it. The, the point about the modeling for communication is goes with anything that you're trying to communicate. It has to be understandable by the uh, by the audience, doesn't it? So Indeed. Yeah. No, good answer. Thank you. Um, typically, what roles should work together to define capabilities, value stream, and information mapping successfully? The roles? What okay. roles? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so, uh, in terms of the, the, the so we, we do a lot of stuff these days uh, with using kind of design thinking techniques. A lot of people are familiar with design thinking, right? And 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 um, design thinking focuses very much on personas. Um, you know, trying to understand people's journeys, whether that's customer journeys. In my world, where there's a lot of um, B two B, so a lot of business to business type engineering organisations. Employee journeys are, are, are often seen as key as well, um, uh, and and one of the the, the things that's uh, and again a little bit of a truism, but um, one of the things that's often missed I've seen even in in design thinking sessions uh, where people talk about customer centricity or or, or person centricity is it still becomes quite easy for the person that you're actually talking about not to be present. Um, and that and that may sound quite daft, but um, you know, the, I was uh, uh, going in and looking at some um, uh, employee murals they were called that had been created by somebody else, um, and they were very nice. Uh, the, the graphics were fantastic on them. Um, that illustrated uh, what somebody on a shop floor would have to do to be able to uh, do certain capabilities, and so this that was. That was kind of the, the, the mural was the first part of understanding 
what they did and then therefore what the value stream was that uh, sort of went behind that. So that could be then broken down into what capabilities were perf being performed and then basically what resources were needed underneath that, which is why this links back to that uh, piece. But the gotcha behind all of that was actually, um, when you kind of uh, dug into where that journey had come from, it was still a view of the pretty much the IT function and a little bit of the operations head office function as to what they thought that person should be doing rather than actually getting those people in the room and, and asking them themselves. So there's still a disconnect there in terms of things. So th clearly the roles require all those kind of skills. Somebody who can understand the business processes, understands industry, somebody who can understand what that means from a process point of view. These sort of classic skills are useful. Um, typically we see those as architects because you know we've got those skills inherently, uh, not ex exclusively. Um, uh, but that connection back to the the person who actually has to do it, you know, if it's a, it's a real customer as opposed to a surrogate customer or a real employee as opposed to a surrogate one, is is the key to all of that. Other skills that you know you can supplement depending on the case. I think. Yeah, yeah. I remember in the example you were talking about of a of a submarines that there was an exercise involving an awful lot of staff and post-it notes and all sorts of things that people who wouldn't normally get involved in this kind of stuff got involved in. So really getting those requirements from yeah, that I level. And very, very much so. And, and just as a, I, I still remember um, having the sessions and people with overalls coming in and um, straight off the shop floor. Um, and, you know, they'd walk in and they had an expression called swarth in their boots, which was the actual, the, the, the pieces of metals off the lathe machines and the oil and everything was on their boots. And, uh, um, you know, you know, and the wearing the overalls and the and the personal protection equipment and putting it down, and the only thing I had to do was was start to kind of make sure that the the notes we took didn't contain all of the language that was <laughs> that was used, um, uh, frankly. But it was the most uh, educational and eye-opening session, um, and really, really valuable because there's so many assumptions and and misperceptions. Uh, mm. um, and, and to that very point, even the head of operations there who considered themselves to be very close and understanding of what was going on said, um, well, they won't, you know, these people won't want to be uh, to, to use uh, phone devices and stuff like that because they're busy and whatever else and, and they're not familiar or whatever. There was a lot of assumptions in there. Um, and we had not only when we had the sessions with these people coming up with ideas about what to do with the tablets and phones, when we had the breaks, they were all getting their phones out and doing their various updates. And it's like, well, they'll all do it anyway, right? So and that may sound obvious, but until you actually see it um, and see that exercise, that um, that link is it can be easily missed. Yeah, OK. Um, so you, you said you were a fan of capabilities. Um, what's your? kind of personal favourite or what do you think w people will find the most useful of the series guides? Oh, um, I, f it, well, um, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a bit like asking who's your favourite child, I suppose, right? Um, <laughs> but um, It's nice that you think of them that way. Yeah, right? yeah, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Um, it, I mean, they, of course, they're all valuable and they all connect and that's the great thing, I think, is uh, uh, you know, when I look at this, the specification, what I think is great is these things have gone into the overall standard, but sometimes because the standard is is a large body of knowledge, rightly so, um, the uh, it's difficult to be able to pull certain pits out, and that's what these series guides do. They help you highlight some of those key things. Mm. Uh, I I am a massive fan of capability modelling. Um, it has always always been something which, uh, to me, has been surprisingly straightforward but incredibly valuable. And one of those things when uh, I don't think I can think of a single occasion where I haven't used that me that technique, um, that uh, capability, and it's not been a friend or an ally. You know, it's just one of those mm -hmm. things whereby um, the, the it's, it's fairly simple, it's fairly straightforward. Most people can readily get to it and, and, and understand what's going on there, and it becomes if nothing else, a good capability model becomes, I, I like to think of it as uh, a washed out wallpaper 
where all of the thinking and the discussion sits on top. The capability model itself isn't important. The dialogue and discussion that sits in front of it right. absolutely That's is. The value. Absolutely is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you keep the models fresh? Um, okay, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, it's a, that's an interesting one. Um, so, this comes back to uh, the, the philosophy about wh how far you're going. Now, things like a capability model that cover um, a larger, can be at an abstracted level, shouldn't change too much. That's the, that's the beauty of them. Unlike, say, process models, whereby you've got continuous process improvement and therefore you expect processes to be constantly improved and constantly updated, otherwise you know, the very name doesn't work. Um, uh, and similarly with organization models, when organizations you know, change, merge, acquire, whatever else, and again, um, you expect those to change. Capability models, as an example, and key, inf and, and key in information models uh, shouldn't change uh, as rapidly at a certain level of abstraction. Mm. Um, but there is a need to keep up with those, obviously. I think what's important, um, and this isn't just true for business architecture, I think this is across the piece, is um, you only need just enough that it's go that, uh, the p so that it's for when something's going to be consumed. So dropping a level lower, you've always got to be very wary of not trying to create something which is going to be out of date at the point of consumption. So currency um, is something that is uh, 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 you've got to be you know, aware of. Mm. So why you would be creating, I, I mean, I, I'd always ask, why you've got the luxury of updating something that isn't about to be used um, <laughs> is an interesting challenge, right? And I don't think people have these days. Um, so actually, the point is, you only need a level of business architecture uh, to which you are going to support your overall roadmap. So you do just enough just in time, right. um, uh, and you have to have some visibility over that. Okay. Paul, we will, we will leave it there. Thank you very much for your thoughts and, uh, and your work on business architecture in the Open Group. So. No, it's a pleasure.